ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us for this latest episode of the INC Preview Show. My name is Carl Bainbridge and I am joined today by a very special guest. Unfortunately, no Gina Howison, no Gareth Kyle, not even Uncle Joey today. We have got John Marsh in MMA, one of the best betting YouTubers on the planet. He's going to talk us through all of the fights which are going to be happening on UFC 253. John, thank you very much for joining us on short notice. Hopefully you give us a bit of a, a Kevin Kroon performance. Yeah, I love that analogy. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. We actually met about two years ago and did my podcast, Martian MMA. And ever since then, I've been following it. It's not fighting cage. Uh, it's not cage fighting. A YouTube channel. Been watching all the videos. I love the the theme videos you do. When the the Conor McGregor video you just came out with, it was great. And of course, you're doing these preview shows where you show that um, you're not just a guy making videos about uh, fun subjects in MMA. You actually know a lot about the sport, the pr predicting the matchups, and uh, it's going to be fun analyzing this pay per view. We got a incredible pay-per-view going down this Saturday uh, from Fight Island with two title fights and I just can't wait to break down those fights with you here, it's Carl. It's just a shame that only about like 10 people watch the preview show. Yeah, well, I'm sure I'm sure the Martian MMA audience will, will uh, bring it up to about 10,000 this week, as my prediction. Well, we certainly hope so, and we do have some fantastic fights to talk about. We'll be going through, we'll be touching on some of the prelim fights and then obviously breaking down the five fights which make up our main card. First thing we need to do though is we need to be talking about some of the big stories which have been happening in MMA. Obviously at the time we record this we had a fight card which took place on Saturday night. And I think there's one big story that came out of that. If you were somebody who maybe had some doubts over the, the Hamzat Shemaev hype train, those doubts have well and truly been laid to rest. This guy is legitimate. Yeah, I mean that knockout, it was stunning. Not what I expected from that fight at all. When I was analyzing that fight, I was pretty much just talking pure grappling, how these guys are going to match up on the floor because Chemayev had shot takedowns right away in all of his fights so far. And he just comes out and knocks GM3 out in 17 seconds. It was incredible. I still have a few reservations about Chemayev. I still think he needs to be proven a little bit more against the higher level of competition. But, I mean, he passed that test so easily. And I don't want to see him drop down to welterweight. I don't want to see him fight 42-year-old Damian Maya. I want to see him stay at middleweight, stay where he seems to be at his physical best, where he's knocking dudes out with one punch, and maybe fight a top 10, top 15 middleweight for his next fight. I don't want to rush him into the top five yet, give him championship-level guys. I mean, I still want to build him up. And I think GM3 was a great step, and I think that the top 15 is likely next um, for Tom Zachemayev. I think maybe Ian Heinish, the guy who just beat um, GM3 as well, would be a great test for Chimaev. He's got great takedown defense, and I'd be interested to see how they, those two match up. And Marvin Vittori is another one that comes to mind. He's kind of at the top of the middleweight. I think he's maybe one of the best middleweights in the world right now, top five. And that might be a little too soon for Chimaev, but, I mean, now it's an amazing fight, and I want to see I'm it. with you. I definitely think middleweight is the best division for him, mainly because... I look at that middleweight division, you don't have all that many wrestlers in the top echelons. Like Adesanya is a kickboxer, Paulo Costa, yes he does have a grappling uh, base with like a jiu-jitsu back belt, but he likes to keep it standing. You don't really have all that many great wrestlers out there. And yet if you go down to welterweight, which is probably his ideal weight class, you've got people like Usman, Colby, uh, Leon Edwards I think is very good on the ground as well. So there's a murderous roar when it comes to grapplers at welterweight. I think he has an easier road to the title by staying at 185. Definitely. I mean, the top four right now at welterweight are Burns, uh, Edwards, Covington, and Usman, and they're all incredible grapplers. Leon is more of an, an anti-grappler, but his takedown defense, his clinch game is great, and I think that that's a bad matchup for Chimaev as well. So, yeah, that's a great point. Middleweight is an easier path that, to the title for him. I don't think anybody would knock him for, for choosing the easier path. It's a it's a better division. I think it has uh, maybe some more exciting matchups. I think the matchups down at welterweight are a little more highly technical, highly analytical matchups where they might not be the most exciting fight. But at middleweight, I think these fights will produce. And I mean, look at the title fight we got this weekend: Costa versus Adesanya. It's going to be a fireworks main event. The best, the, one of the best fights you can get in MMA right now. So I understand staying at middleweight for Chimaya. Unpopular opinion: I'm more excited about Adesanya versus Costa than I am for Khabib versus Gaethje. I don't think that's. There's anything wrong with that. I mean, the way these two match up, there, there's. 
I would be surprised to see any grappling in in Izzy versus Costa. It's just going to be two guys standing on the feet, trading, exchanging at some of the highest level striking exchanges we've seen in MMA history. So it's going to be a pleasure to watch. It's just Gaethje and Khabib is a different fight. That's going to be incredible too, but it's going to be a different battle. It's going to be a battle of striker versus grappler and a battle of distance. And Israel versus Costa is just going to be, uh, you know, I think it could be chaos. It could be, uh, I think, Paulo Costa is going to bring the fight early, and it's going to turn into an insane striking battle between the two. And speaking of Khabib versus Gagey, we need to talk about somebody who Khabib or Gagey could be fighting in the near future. R months and years of rumors and speculation around this guy, it finally happened. Michael Chandler is in the UFC. Yeah, shocking news. I mean, for years and years, it seemed like... Dana White was kind of shying away from Michael Chandler. Maybe, maybe maybe, Chandler didn't want to come to the UFC. He was always negotiating like he was gonna, but then never did. And then late into his career, 2020, he is signed with the UFC. He is, I think, a little bit past his prime at this point, but I think he's still a very dangerous fighter. I think he has some fun matchups at lightweight. And I don't like the move of him being the backup. How do you feel about that, him being the official backup for the title fight, Carl? I think Carl? that's a big power player move from the UFC. I think their intention was to have uh, Tony or Dustin, depending on who dropped out. Uh, one of those would be taking that fight on short notice. Um, I think the Chandler being in there is purely a, a, a money move, a power play from the UFC. Because obviously Dustin wanted more money, Tony backed him up because he wanted the fight as well. And Dana just said, stuff it, you're both off the card, which... I understand it from Dana's perspective, he's always been a man who wants the UFC to be the selling point rather than the fighter. But he's upset a lot of fans by saying, hey, stuff you, I'm doing it this way. Yeah, I mean, he, he's cutthroat. We know that now. He doesn't really care about what the fans want. He cares about what makes money and what is the right business decision. That's a great point. He said, you know, you guys can negotiate if you want. You are replaceable. I got a guy to replace you already. It doesn't matter if he doesn't deserve this or not. I said that's how it is, and that's how it is. And it's a power play. It's a money move from Dana. And, I mean, let's just pray that neither of those guys get injured because if I saw – Michael Chandler coming to the UFC and get an undisputed title shot in his first fight, and Tony Ferguson didn't get one undisputed title shot in his 13-fight win streak. I mean, I think that the UFC would just lose so much credibility, and the win streaks would mean nothing anymore. The rankings mean nothing, and you're just bringing guys in and throwing them right into the top. I mean, that's, that's just a very messed up thing to do, but... That's the way it is. I'm still excited for Chandler. I hope that he doesn't. Uh, he's not the backup, and we get him some more exciting matchups uh, at the top ten of lightweight. I did read an interesting stat though, which was there's been eight former Bellator champions who later fought in the UFC, and only two of them have winning records: Alexander Volkov and Eddie Alvarez. Yeah, I saw that stat as well, and I think Alvarez is, what, 4-3, and three, and Volkov is maybe 5-2 and two or something, so it doesn't seem like they do well transitioning, and I think that I think that Dana has a little bit of a, uh, a stigma about bringing Bellator fighters over. I mean, look at the amount of fighters that we sign, uh, we being the UFC, sign from the LFA or local regional promotion CFFC in America, Cage Warriors is a great one. But they're not really bringing anybody from Bellator. They're not bringing people from 1FC. It seems like they don't like bringing guys over from like their direct competitors, the highest-ranking MMA organizations. They kind of like going with those lower-level organizations. Which I think it's a real shame as well because I know Bellator gets a lot of ridicule, a lot of grief. But some of the top guys in Bellator are actually very talented. I mean, I would love to see people like uh, Lima, Pitbull, um, AJ McKee. I'd love to see those guys in the UFC. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of guys. There's that uh, Amsarov guy. I think he's like 21 and one over there. Welterweight. I mean, there's a lot of great fighters they have over there. It's just the way Bellator match makes, and I, I don't know. I feel like every Bellator card I've watched in my life has let me down, and there's just been some worst case scenario thing happened. It just seems like Bellator is truly cursed. I mean, look at their last fight. I mean, the main event was was terrible between Machida and Davis. The Raymond Daniels uh, had the, the low blows. I mean, it just fell apart in front of our eyes. Yeah, it wasn't a great show. Um, I remember I, I set that one to tape and I was just, I even knew was, the fight was going to be a decision. I turned off the main event after the first round because I just knew this is going to a decision. It's not going to be an exciting fight. And unfortunately, that proved to be the case. 
Yeah, I mean, it just seems like Bellator can't avoid that, but that's okay. Uh, it uh, looks like their good fighters are on the way to the UFC, so let's let's keep that trend going. I'm fine I do with like that. the Thursday move, though. I, I like them going to Thursdays, and I like the moves they're making in Europe as well. First show in France. But yeah, I've heard, yeah, they're doing that. that. That's a good sign, and I think they're getting rid of the tape delay. They're on CBS Sports Network now, which is a bigger network, so I hope they I hope they succeed. I'll, I wish them all the best over at Bellator. We are here, though, to be talking about the UFC events. UFC 253 is taking place. We are going back to Fight Island, and I've mentioned this a couple of times when I've talked to GM and Gareth, etc. While I do like what the UFC have done in this sort of COVID climate, in trying to get events happening and still trying to make it feel like an, an enjoyable show to watch. I do feel when it comes to the pay-per-views, there's just something lacking. I feel like I feel like title fights and the big matchups, they need the crowd, they need that atmosphere to go with it. And I know that the UFC can't help it, but that atmosphere just is not there when it comes to the pay-per-views. Yeah, I feel that way too. I mean, it's definitely something is missing when when the crowd isn't there when you don't hear the roar of the crowd i mean just watching israel adesanya versus kelvin gastelum is just such an incredible experience because you hear the crowd going crazy the sequence in the fifth round when israel almost gets a triangle and they stand up the crowd just goes absolutely ballistic it's just it adds so much to the fight and it seems like we're becoming used to not having the fans in there but man is it still weird when you still think about that these guys are fighting in a dead silent arena and when they're used to fighting in front of 10 15 thousand people look at israel adesanya he fought in front of fifty five thousand people last fight uh, well, actually, no, two fights ago, and now he's fighting in front of 50. So it, it's a huge change. It definitely takes a little bit away from it, but, I mean, the fights are still the same in the cage. We just got to focus on the skill level and the technique that we're seeing between these, these great athletes. So I'm still excited for the pay-per-view no matter what. I feel what. it's a real disappointment as well for the fighters who are getting these title fights in the COVID era because the one that sticks in my mind is Felicia Spencer. Like, in all seriousness... Felicia Spencer's only chance to be a UFC champion happened at UFC 250. And you'd think, you worked all, you worked so hard in your career to try and reach this once in a lifetime opportunity. And instead of getting 20,000 people cheering your name and all the spotlight on you, you're doing it in front of a few dozen people in the warehouse in Las Vegas. Yeah, I, th I mean, in, in Spencer's case, I still think that that worked out pretty well for her because I don't know if she necessarily deserved that that spotlight to begin with, with the, the technique and skill that she's shown so far in the UFC. But yeah, I do understand what you're saying. She's definitely a little underwhelmed from that title shot. But maybe maybe it's better that nobody saw her put up that effort where she got, what, 50, 40, Ford or something like that in that fight. But um, I, I definitely agree with the points you're making about the, the audience, Carl. Uh, and hopefully we can start to get some limited audiences back in the, in the UFC events soon. We will be talking about UFC 253 in a bit more detail. And for our first point, we will be looking at the prelims. We've got a list of those there on the screen right now. Uh, some of the big names that stand out for me, uh, there is one quite well-known one, which is Diego Sanchez, 30-12. and 12. Surprisingly, three wins in his past four. But it's a guy as well who's mired in a little bit of... How should I put this? It's not an enjoyable experience to watch Diego Sanchez fight anymore. The guy's an absolute legend, but I feel uneasy these days watching him fight. Yeah, I mean, that last fight was, was something. It was incredible. I actually bet on Diego Sanchez in that fight, and I had subtracted the money from my spreadsheet. I counted it as a loss, and then he took that illegal knee, pulled the veteran move by uh, milking the injury, saying he can't continue, and left the, the cage with a win. So that was impressive. And even his wins over, um, what was it, Craig White or whatever the guy's name was, and Mickey Gall, those were great wins. He took those guys down. He showed good grappling, but... Since he's come over to Josh Fabian, it seems like a lot of his fighting technique has gone out the window. I mean, he was doing that that stance when he was just walking away from all the strikes from Pereira. I mean, it was funny to watch, but it seemed like he had no initiative to win. It seemed like he wasn't trying to hit takedowns. He wasn't trying to knock him out. It was like he was just fighting to, to get a paycheck and not to take damage. So... Jake Matthews, tough opponent. I think he pretty much, as long as he stays standing on the feet and walks forward, I think he's going to win. I think if he throws a few strikes, doesn't end up on his back, I think he, he'll win because Sanchez's 
just not the same. It doesn't seem like he's fighting to win anymore. What do you think? I Paul? think it's a shame. I think it's a shame to see. I think Diego. I think he's still got the drive to fight, and I think he still wants to win. But I just don't. I think physically, it's 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 almost a bit like what happened with Chuck Liddell when he fought Tito. You could see the mind still thought he had it, but the body just wasn't responding anymore. And they always say that the last person to know when you're done is yourself. And I think Diego's going through that right now. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I think there's a little different though. I just, I don't even know if he, he shows the will to win in there anymore. I mean, I, I didn't look at the official uh, strike numbers or how many strikes he landed versus Michel Pereira, but I'm expecting it to be like 15 over the course of 12 minutes because he was really doing nothing in that fight. Um, was eating some big shots. I mean, he's still durable. He still can take a big punch. I mean, he's eating some massive knees to the body versus Pereira. Yeah, he landed 25 significant strikes in that fight over the course of 12 or 13 minutes. So about two strikes a minute. So I just I just don't think you can win fights when you're throwing two strikes a minute and you're not really getting takedowns. And I think Matthews is just a pretty bad matchup for Sanchez at this point. Given the choice, who would you rob in your corner during this lockdown? Josh Fabia or Mike Perry's girlfriend? I knew that was coming. Mike Perry's girlfriend all day. She, I think she's honest. She's she's one and as a coach, right? Uh, Fabian is uh, a one and one. So technically, Mike Perry's girlfriend's got a better uh, coaching record. And you know, look at look at Mike Perry knocking people out in the cage on the street. I mean, how can you deny the results of Mike Perry's girlfriend as a coach? And the corner advice was right. He was doing great. Yeah, yeah. Shout out Latori. I forget her last name, but Latori is her first name. She's on the up and up. In terms of other people which are on the prelims as well, as to be expected when it comes to an Adesanya undercard, we've got a lot of city kickboxing guys there, a lot of Australian Kiwi fighters. Uh, Brad Riddell is the name that sticks out for me. He 2 0 in the UFC, in my opinion, looked very good in his last performance, especially his takedown defense. Fighter the night performance as well against Jimmy Malarkey on his debut. Do I ever see him being a title challenger? I don't think so, but he's going to be one of those guys at at welterweight who's just going to be putting on these barn burners. He's going to be like a Nico Price sort of a figure. Yeah, I think uh, you say welterweight. I think he's he's lightweight, isn't he? Sorry, but again, lightweight. What a murderous Um, one! Like even outside the top fifteen, great division. Yeah, I mean, I'm very high on Riddell as well. I mean, you said that you might not be able to write him off as a challenger a title challenger yet i mean i think he's i think he has all the potential in the world i mean a lot of people don't don't know about his kickboxing credentials one of the best kickboxing credentials on the ufc roster i mean he fought really high level kickboxers has some good wins over great guys and it shows i mean his striking is so crisp he was like you said out striking um, magomed mustafaev he did so versus malarkey as well in that exciting fight but I was a little more concerned when rewatching the Riddell fight with versus Mustafaev because he was landing hard strikes. He actually dropped Mustafaev in round one, but he would Mustafaev recovered and was attempting takedowns. He had that body lock against the cage, and Riddell couldn't break that body lock. He was tied up against the cage versus Mustafaev for about three and a half minutes in round one. So luckily he landed that knockdown in the first 60 seconds of the round because if it weren't for that, he might have lost that round. And the same thing happened in rounds two and three. He was landing the hard strikes. He just couldn't avoid uh, getting stuck against the cage. He was defending the takedowns. He wasn't getting put on his back and wasn't getting um, stuck in guard or anything bad like that. But it just seemed like he couldn't break that lock of Mustafaev. And that's a big concern. Um, how much do you know about uh, Leco de Silva? Have you watched a lot of Silva, Carl? Uh, well, I am surprised at the fact for, um, for a 24-year-old guy, he has had a lot of fights. Uh, I sometimes find with a lot of the Brazilian fighters that sometimes their record is a little bit, a little bit worse than what it actually is. Um, I mean, this guy's what twenty-one and two, so he's been fight. He's yeah. fought a lot for a guy who's very young, and you sometimes question how good the guys he's actually fighting are on the Brazilian regional scene. 
Yeah, 100%. I mean, I watched a lot of his regional fights, and he is a pretty uh, submission-reliant guy. He is a, a very solid grappler, but I think he's a little one-dimensional in that sense. His striking is definitely way behind in his grappling, and a lot of his, his wins are all over lower-level guys. And I think that some of his inexperience showed in his first fight against uh, Yakulayev. He was winning that fight and going for takedowns, but then just... Went for a lazy takedown, left his neck out, got guillotined, and that was all she wrote. And his last win over Vargas, it was a decent performance. He dominated that fight, but Vargas just had no um, adversity. I mean, he was not stopping takedowns at all. Silva was just getting on top, riding him out from top position. So it was a nice win to get back on track. And I just I'm a little underwhelmed with Silva. But that being said, I still think this is going to be a close fight because Silva att- attempts a ton of takedowns. He's very hard to get off you when he's on top. And I'm just not totally confident in Riddell's takedown defense and his footwork for MMA. I mean, the footwork between kickboxing and MMA is so different. And now he has to circle a lot more. He has to avoid getting his back to the cage. And it seems like he still has a little bit of inexperience in staying off of the cage and avoiding those takedown entries. So I think that Riddell is going to be the better striker here, no question. He's going to be outstriking Landon hard shots versus Silva on the feet. But Silva's going to be shooting those takedowns. He's going to be trying to grind. Riddell out against the cage and I just don't think Riddell has shown enough to think he can stop those takedowns yet so I'll still pick Riddell as an official prediction Riddell by decision but I think that Leco de Silva is is very live in this fight and could win with his grappling any other notable names for you on the prelims um we saw um a few Contender Series guys, uh, Cameron Knight, those guys are big, athletic, light heavyweights. I'm looking forward to that one. That should be a lot of fun. The return of Juan Espino. Uh, I think we mentioned that uh, earlier when we were talking. Are you excited for the return of Juan Espino, or do you think that maybe 39 years old is a little bit too little too late for Espino? Well, that's basically a baby by heavyweight standards. You're just coming into a crime at <laughs> 39 years old. I just find it really intriguing that we had a guy who was the last ever Ultimate Fighter, and yet it's taken him, what, nearly two years to actually get back into the octagon. I don't know what's been happening behind the scenes. I don't know if he's had any injury issues. I just find that really intriguing, and especially as well, because we've got rumours that the Ultimate Fighter could be coming back, that the last Ultimate Fighter still has yet to make his UFC debut. So I'm intrigued to see what he does against Jeff Hughes. I think that's a winnable fight for me. I'm not really high on on Jeff Hughes as a fighter, I think. So I think it's a winnable fight for Espino, but I certainly don't see him making inroads. He's not going to be like a civil guard who's going to be charging up the rankings. Yeah, 100% agreed. It was an injury, actually. I think he had surgery on his hand. He was out for a while there. Um, And yeah, I'm really underwhelmed with Jeff Hughes. I think... um, that he showed a lot of weaknesses in his UFC career. I mean, Todd Duffy was fighting him not too long ago. Duffy attempted takedowns. He got in on Hughes' hips and maybe got him down once or twice, but didn't really establish top position. But that was all I really needed to see. I just don't think that Hughes has the footwork or the striking to hurt Espino on the feet. I don't think he can stop those takedown defense. So uh, so I think Espino gets him down, probably submits him somewhere along the line. And I would like to see Espino tested. I mean, he does have a good style for a heavyweight. I mean, some guys just can't stop takedowns, and he has a heavy top game, good submission game. So I think he probably takes down and uh, submits Hughes here. Uh, but I'm still not you know, completely sold on him. I would like to see him face some higher level competition in, in the future. I do like the guy on Twitter who said this was like a pound shop, uh, Ben Rothwell versus Frank Mia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did see that, that, that uh, Photoshop or that comparison. Yeah, that was, that's funny. So that's our rundown of the prelim fights. It's time to get to the juicy stuff. We're going into the main card itself. So our fight opener, we're going down to the featherweight division. And it is a case of Canada versus Russia. It is Akeem Dawadu taking on, I hope I pronounced this right, Zubaira Tukahop. I, I, I knew I wouldn't, I knew I wouldn't get it right. I'm just going to call him Zub- Zubaira. Uh, Dawadu versus yep. Zubaira. Uh, intriguing one, this one. Bookmakers have it fairly close. Uh, Dawadu is a minus 110 favorite. You can get two to Hugov at minus 120. This is the first appearance of 2024, Hakeem. It's going to be the second for Zubaira. Um, I think a real interesting contrast of styles between two guys who, with the right momentum, could maybe start to make inroads into the top 15. 
Yeah, great fight. As you mentioned, the odds on this one real close. It's pretty much a coin flip, pick em type of fight. And rightfully so. You got the better striker in Hakeem Dawadu, and you got the better grappler in Zubaria. And it's just going to be a, a real battle between position in this fight. But I think that uh, Tukunov, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name either, let's call him Zubaria, can, can compete on the feet. I mean, he has some decent striking. He has real power in his hands. I think Zubaira is a little bit of a power-reliant fighter. I don't think he's the most skilled fighter, but, I mean, he's athletic. He has a lot of power in his punches. He has explosive takedowns. So he's hard to deal with, and it's going to be a tough matchup for Hakeem. And Hakeem has really impressed me in his UFC run. His striking is really high level. I mean, he outstruck Julio Arce, who I rate very highly. Um, but his takedown defense has uh, shown some holes. He got double leg takedown a few times uh, by Kyle Botchniak. He was hard to hold down. He's real athletic. He popped right back up to his feet. But I think that's going to be a different story versus Zubaira because those double leg takedowns are going to land. Zubaira might get top time for a minute or two. He might not do much with those takedowns. But when these rounds are going to be close and Zubaira has those takedowns to lean on, I think that that's going to be a big edge for him in this fight. In terms of an official prediction, I think I'm going to go with Hakeem to stand up from those takedowns and to land the more damage on the feet in this one. I think he edges a close 29-28 decision, um, but it's going to be a real close fight. I think Zubaira has a great chance to win if he can get his takedowns going. And even on the feet, Zubaira can't be taken lightly. He was able to drop and knock out Kevin Aguilar in his last fight with punches. So Zubaira is well-rounded. He only has two fights in his past four years, so that's why he may be getting a little underrated here. I think if uh, Zubaira was more active, we could see him as a, a, a bigger favor here. Uh, but it's a it's a pick him for a reason. It's a very close fight. I'm going to go with Hakeem by decision as my pick. And uh, what are you going with, uh, Carl? And I think it's a very tricky one. I think that, obviously, I would say Hakeem is the more well-known name. He's fought in the UFC. Um, he's been a lot more active in the UFC than what Zubaira has. But if you look at Zubaira's record, you've got, what, six fights in the UFC, four wins, one loss, and one draw. That one loss was against Hinato Moyakano. And we saw what Moyakano was doing in the featherweight division. Um, I actually thought at one point he was going to be fighting for the title. I thought he was going to beat Jose Aldo when they fought at um, uh, Fortaleza. So, which shows how highly regarded I rate him. So no shame in losing to uh, Moyakano on a split decision. Um... I think when it comes to Zubaira, you look at him, obviously he's from Dagestan, he trains with Khabib, he was actually the guy who punched Connor in the 229 brawl, where I think a lot of people maybe know that name from, um, and you just think, oh, he's just going to be wrestling people down. I think he's a lot more diverse when it comes to the striking than what Khabib is. Um, I think he has good, powerful takedowns, but I think he maybe struggles to hold people down in the way that Khabib can. I mean, Khabib can just clamp on people and just hold them there and wear them down for the rest of the round. I don't think Zubaira has that. He has good takedowns, but he struggles to keep them up. When it comes to the stand-up, I think he's he's very unpredictable. Um, I think especially he's he likes to favor that spinning back fist. He sort of almost uses it as a range finder, uh, which I find very strange. And again, you saw good power on his good power in his hands. Drop Kevin Aguilar. I thought that was a really good performance from that part. Um, I think what's going to determine this fight for me is how Akeem dictates the pace. What Zubaira struggled with in Moyakano was that Moyakano was allowed to slow the pace down and fight at his own speed. Akeem needs to do that. So Akeem needs to do, I think he needs to work his leg kicks um, to try and maybe just get Zubaira fighting at his own pace. If he does that, I think we can maybe see in the later rounds Hakeem starting to come into his own. Because I do think Hakeem gets better as the fight goes on. He's not the best starter. Yeah, agreed. I have seen seen some reservations about um, his starting rate. Sometimes he starts real slow in the first round, picks it up. And yeah, great point about the pace. I mean, a faster, more chaotic pace does favor Zubaira. A slower, more methodical, technical pace favors Hakeem. Because he's the more technical striker, and I think we will start to see that. The leg kicks will be big. Zubaria is very heavy on that lead leg when he's coming forward. 
And uh, good point about the comparisons to Khabib. He does train with them, but very different styles. And, I mean, Zubaira is actually one of the most popular guys in the UFC. He's got like 3 million followers on Instagram. So very unknown fact. He's very well known across Europe and in Russia. Very popular guy and uh, has a lot of fan favorite behind him. That's why we see him on the main card. But what a fight to kick off the main card. Really competitive fight. Really looking forward to this one. And I think it should be close. And either guy who wins, I think it'll be a close decision. I'm going to favor Zubaira between the two, uh, simply because usually when it comes to strikers versus grapplers, I usually favor the grappler. Um, I think Hakeem's takedown defense maybe is a bit better than maybe what you make it out to be, but the combination of the slow start of Hakeem added with that takedown prowess of Zubaira, I'm leaning towards him. I do think it's going to be a close fight. I'm going to say 29-28, Zubaira. Nice. I like the pick. Will you be liking our next pick, though, because we are going uh, down to the bantamweight division, the women's bantamweight division. Now, this one is a bit of a short-notice fight. Ketlin Vieira was set to face Marion Renault. Uh, unfortunately, Marion had some injury issues, had to pull out of the fight, which I think is a real shame because I think that could have been an interesting ground battle between Ketlin and Marion. Stepping in on short notice, surprising for a lot of people considering she only just fought Sejari Eubanks. So we've got the number 7 seed taking on the number 13. Um, I think it's going to be interesting in this regard as well because we have two very different approaches when it comes to fighter activity. You've got Ketlin, who has had one fight in the past three years. She's had a lot of injury issues, a lot of um, detrimental sides on uh, detrimental issues on her side. And Sijava, who just jumped straight back in after beating Julia Avila and says, you know what, I didn't pick up any damage, I want to fight again. Yeah, great point. The inactivity is a big problem here for Vieira. One fight in two and a half years, and that one fight lasted five minutes, and she was knocked out in that fight. I don't think she approached that fight with the right strategy. I think she was trading punches on the feet with the better boxer in Aldana. She paid the ultimate price. I mean, highlight real knockout from Aldana there. And it's a good thing Vieira took some time off to recover from that, maybe work on her game a little bit. But I was a little unimpressed with Vieira in that fight. I thought that she seemed like they're pretty much the same fighter that she was uh, versus McMahon and versus Zingano. And those are really her two best wins, the Zingano win and uh, the McCann submission, actually. She was able to submit McCann on the ground, so that's a huge feather in her cap. But... I think she was actually struggling with the takedowns of McCann, was stuck on her back in round one of that fight. Maybe McCann gassed out a little and uh, was submitted in round two. The Zingano fight was a real sloppy back and forth grappling fight. She was able to win that fight comfortably. That was a split decision, but I scored that fight 30-27 for Vieira when I rewatched it a few days ago. So that was an impressive performance from Vieira, but I just don't think that... Um, Zingano has a, the takedown defense compared to uh, Eubanks. I think that Eubanks actually might be a better grappler. That was a Im really impressive win versus Julia Avila. As you mentioned, she was a plus 250 underdog in that fight. And I think she might have won all three rounds. She was hitting takedowns in all three rounds. Um, I didn't like how Sajara was exchanging some wild combinations on the feet. I didn't remember this, but when I was re-watching it, the first 60 seconds of that fight, she was just trading wild punches with Avila. She ate a few big shots. She seemed to eat them well, and she came forward and landed her own takedown. But that's not a good strategy against Vieira. I think Vieira is the better striker. I think she just hits way harder, has way more power behind her punches. Eubanks is not a terrible striker, but she is a former flyweight so I think that we're going to see a size advantage for Vieira here, and I think we're going to see it in the impact of their punches. I think Vieira is just going to be landing harder. But it's going to come down to whether Vieira can stop the takedowns. It's going to come down to who can hit the takedowns because Vieira likes going for her offensive takedowns as well, and it could be a battle of who hits the first takedown could win the fight. And I do think that Eubanks uh, might be the better overall grappler. I was impressed with her cardio in her past few fights. She had a notorious cardio issues in her UFC career, but then was able to correct those in her past two fights. She hit takedowns in all three rounds versus Maras and versus Avila. So her cardio seems to be improving. And as you mentioned, the activity is such a big factor here. One fight for Vieira in two and a half years, probably about six or seven fights for Sajara in that time, picking up good wins over Avila 
Silva, Roxanne Modafari, Lauren Murphy. I mean, those are legit female fighters, and they're still very relevant in the top 10 of the division at, down to flyweight. So I think I'm going to go with uh, Sajara Eubanks here. I like the activity. She seems hungry. She wants to come in here and get this another win. I think she hits takedowns. Uh, she keeps top control, and she outgrapples Vieira here. But it's going to be a close fight on the feet. It could even be a close fight on the ground. And it's uh, I like Eubanks as an underdog. Vieira is a near a minus 200 favorite, and I just think that's wrong. She hasn't shown enough in the past few years to prove that she should be that uh, 65% favorite here. So I like Eubanks as a, a bet and a pick in this one. I think she wins by decision. I think we talk about the inactivity of Ketlin Vieira in terms of how it's going to affect her performance. I think it's also had an effect in the hype surrounding her. Because a lot of people forget after that Kat Singano fight, Ketlin Vieira was an unbeaten fighter. She'd moved up to number two in the world. And a lot of people were saying that she was going to be next in line for a title shot. A lot, a lot of people were saying that considering how good of her ground game was, she would have had a good chance of being champion. Uh, but I think a combination of being out for so long, obviously the Aldana knockout happened as well. And now she's dropped down to number seven and nobody's talking about her anymore. When they're talking about like the next title challenge, they're talking about Arini Aldana, they're talking about Aspen Ladd. Ketlin sort of got a bit lost in the shuffle, which I think's a real risk to take because you look at the size of this girl. This is a big bantamweight fighter. I've watched the Arini Aldana fight beforehand, and Arini gets a lot of comments in terms of how tall and how long she is for the division. Vieira looked pretty much the same size for me, like big, broad shoulders. Um, I think she's got a great, uh, I think she's got a great judo game, a great grappling game as well, and I think that size difference, more than anything, is going to be the biggest factor in this fight. I do like the improvements that Sejara Eubanks has made. I think she started getting used to fighting as a 135er, but I saw this against Avalar. She is small for that division. She carries a lot of muscle, but her frame is tiny, and I just have this fear that if Ketlin is able to get it down. Sarge isn't going to be able to get back up. Yeah, I think that's a real concern. I think, like I mentioned, the first one to hit a takedown might win this fight. And it could be Vieira, but she attempted a lot of takedowns versus Ngano and versus McMahon. But when you, we watched that uh, Aldana fight this week, I was like, where, where's the wrestling at? Did she attempt any oh. takedowns? And the official, the official statistics had zero sta takedown attempts for her. So if she's coming in versus a woman in Aldana who has struggled with grappling, who is, I think, was clearly the better striker on tape. I just think that that was a really bad sign from her coaches, from her camp, that she went in with the wrong game plan there. And it seems like, yeah, if she takes down Sajara, she might have a good path to victory there. I just don't trust her to, to execute that game plan. So it's a real close fight for a reason. Uh, I think that I think that I'm siding with Eubanks because of that activity and just she's she's been more proven. She's had so much more, so many more wins in the time that Vieira had that I just I think I got to go with her in this one. Uh, who are you going with as an official pick, I would Carl? lean towards Ketlin. I can see Ketlin maybe taking this possibly 30-27. I just think that size advantage that she has is going to be too much. The one thing I will say, though, and I'll, I'll give Sarge a lot of praise for this. Sajara Eubanks, if you look at a lot of people maybe in the MMA community, they're a bit dismissive of Sajara, which, based on what I've seen in her career, especially since moving up to Bantamweight, I think it's maybe a bit unjustified because she's had she had fun she had a fun fight with Aspen Ladd. I thought the Betch Cohera fight, yes, she was on the wrong side of that. I thought that was an entertaining fight. And then two good wins. That fight with Julia Avila, that striking battle, that was something like Diego Sanchez versus Clay Guida. So I think I think Sarge maybe gets a, a bad rap from people, so I just wanted to maybe iron that out. Um Definitely. I mean, she. I think she missed weight for her title fight back in the day. Um, she lost to Betch Cohea. So I think, yeah, you're right. She does get a little um, overly criticized, in my opinion. But I think she's making big uh, fight-to-fight -fight improvements here. And it should be a close fight. I like that we're disagreeing on the yes. picks. We're both yeah. going different ways so far. Here's one thing I will say just before we go on to the next fight. We're talking about the grappling prowess of these two fighters. How many times have we seen great jiu-jitsu practitioners, great wrestlers, etc. Neutralize each other out and just say, you know what, we're just going to have a kickboxing match. Could we, could this happen this time? Yeah, I think that that's real, real possible. 
Um, I don't think it's it's very possible from Sajara because she does attempt takedowns in all of her fights. She's hit a takedown in every single one of her UFC fights, win or lose. And especially in round one, she has a problem. Well, it wasn't a problem in her last fight where I think that she shoots a takedown with technique. She goes in with a nice entry. She pushes her opponent back to the cage. And if they're stuffing it, she just clasps her hands together and uses all her strength to lift her opponent up and slam her down. And it worked versus Avila. She did the same thing versus Kohea. But I think sometimes those actions mm-hmm. tire her out. And those big, huge strength takedowns, and I think that she could be doing that here. Like you said, Vera is so much bigger. She might be using a lot of energy to outgrapple her. She might gas out. She might stay on the feet and get outstruck. So I, I think that Vera does have more ways to win. I agree with her being like a slight favorite in this one, but just not quite a 65% favorite. I think it's more about 55% for Vieira. So I'm happy to bet uh, Sajara for small. Haven't bet her yet, but we'll look to see where it goes throughout the week. And maybe I'll change my pick if I do some more tape. But as of now, I'm leaning Eubanks. But you bring up some great points about Vieira. I hope you don't change this call after we edit the whole thing before we get this uploaded. Oh, no, don't worry about that. We will be going on to fight number three. Uh, we've gone from the women's bantamweight division. We are now going down to the flyweight division. Now, if there has been one good thing to happen in MMA in 2020, I mean, I know it's been a difficult year for a lot of people, what's been happening in the world. In terms of an MMA context, if there has been one good thing to come out of it, it's been the re-emergence of the flyweight division. This was a division which, around the time of Demetrius Johnson being champion, a lot of people were thinking, they're just going to get rid of the whole thing. They're just going to axe all the flyweights and just put that down as just a forgotten memory, just remember when we thought that was a good idea. But they stuck with it. The fight quality improved. Davidson Figueiredo is now the champion. Flyweight's going to be headlining a pay-per-view in November. And we've got a flyweight fight here. Kai Kawa Francis taking on Brandon Royval. Uh, we've got the number 7 seed taking on the number 10. And a great striker versus grappler matchup. Yeah, agreed. Great, great points about flyweight. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the flyweight division. I mean, I don't know how anybody can be critical of the flyweight division when Davison Figueroa, one of the best action fighters, one of the most powerful punchers in the entire sport, is the champion. That guy was never going to produce a, a boring fight. Although he had one boring fight against uh, Formiga, but I mean, that was a high level chess match of grappling. And this is a great matchup too. I think that Kai Car France is a very well rounded fighter. Comes from the city kickboxing gym as well, so they've got a lot of momentum. And Roy Vall, I'm a little uh, more unimpressed with. I mean, he just came over from LFA. He picked up a nice win over um, Tim Elliott, but that win, I think, was more of a, a Tim Elliott loss than it was a Roy Vall win. I mean, Elliott was taken down and out grappling Roy Vall for the first seven or eight minutes of the fight. Elliott started to gas really badly in round two, and Elliott was still taking down Roy Vall. It took about two minutes into that round before Elliott was just totally gassed, went on his back, and Roy Vall was able to submit him with an arm triangle. So it was impressive that he with, uh, withstood that early storm, that he was able to stay tough and to stay resilient and get that win after losing the first bit of that fight. But I still think I'm far from impressed with uh, Roy Vall. I think he's a pretty weak striker. He's a pretty submission-reliant guy. And even even his grappling, I don't think he's a great takedown guy. I don't think he has incredible top control. He's a good uh, scrambler. He's good at catching submissions and scrambles. And he's a very hard guy to hold down. But I just see this fight as Kai Car France being the much more well-rounded fighter. I think he has the takedown defense to stop the takedowns of uh, Brandon Roy Vall. And I think he's the much better striker on the feet. So I think Kai Car France could run away with this one. We might even see a late finish from Kai Car France, even though he's not much of a finisher. But I think in rounds two and three, this could be a, a beatdown from uh, KKF here. So I'm going to pick uh, Kai Car France by decision. And the odds in this one, I think that uh, Kai Car France minus 230. Yeah, I think that there might even be some value left at, on minus 230. I would think that uh, France's chances here are about 75%. So not giving too much credit to Roy Vall. I do think he can maybe win some matchups at flyweight, but Kai Car France is not one of them. What are you thinking about this fight, uh, I think Carl? Roy Val's best chance of winning this one is going to be early in the first. When both fighters are dry, and that's when, in my opinion, Roy Val does some of his best work. I do agree with you. I don't think he's maybe the best takedown fighter. Um, but the way this guy chains submissions is something which I do like. 
He goes from triangles to arm bars to omoplatas. Um, I, I watched one of his fights in LF, LFA, and that was basically what he was doing. He pulled guard and was just trying to chain submissions until one of them stuck, and eventually he ended up getting it. Which, I think that sort of submission-based game of pulling guard works on the regional scene. You have to be very, very elite to get it done in the big leagues. I think someone made a comparison on Twitter. He, he's sort of like a flyweight Paul Craig. Paul Craig has a very similar sort of fighting style. Um, which, again, you can find certain success with that, but it does get much harder when you're reaching the top tens of a division. And I think with Kai Kara France, he's in a great run of form. I think he's only, I think he's only lost one of his past ten. And I think that was against uh, Brandon Moreno, I think he lost to. Um, yep. So, good run of form. Uh, fantastic takedown defence as well. I just think he's going to have too much for Royval on the feet. I do think Royval's going to be trying to pull some sneaky tricks, trying to pull guard, trying to make some submissions happen. I can maybe see like a flying armbar attempt something along those sort of lines. I just don't think he's going to have all that much success. I just don't see Kai getting submitted. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that the only time he's really struggled with grappling in the UFC was versus Holyon Paiva. He was actually attempting to take Paiva down. Paiva stuffed those shots and was able to reverse and end up on top sometimes. But I think Paiva is a much more well-rounded fighter everywhere than Roy Vall is. And yeah, I just think this is too much too soon for Roy Vall. They're kind of throwing him in a little too uh, soon here. Um, so I think he does lose his fight. But um, I'm still a fan of the guy. I think he uh, you know, won a lot of fans with that interview when it, with his uh, last fight. When he admitted that you know he was going to have to go to work on Monday, and now he doesn't because he won that fifty thousand dollar bonus. You like seeing those stories in the sport, but in terms of a matchup in this one, I don't think it's a good one for him. One thing I will say, which maybe gives him a bit of an advantage, I do think. I mean, I love Kai's striking, but he does have a tendency to get hurt, and for a guy who's still quite young, he's only like twenty six years old. There's a lot of knockout losses on that record. Yeah, I, I'm. I think uh, you might think I'm super high on France just from the way I'm talking about him, but I, it's really this matchup. This matchup really favors him. But overall, I do think I'm a little unimpressed with his striking. I thought that he got outstruck by Julian Paiva. Um, Brandon Moreno gave him a lot of trouble in the boxing. So I think a lot of the high-level guys, Alex Perez, Marino, uh, Figueredo, they would give Kaikar France a lot of trouble. And maybe even like guys like David Dvorak that we saw last Johnny night. I mean, incredible performance. Yeah, and I think that that guy could be a top five in flyweight um, for a good amount of time to come. Askar Askarov is a tough matchup. So I think that Kai Kor France is a very solid, well-rounded fighter. I don't think he excels anywhere, but I think he is a very uh, you know B-plus fighter everywhere, and I think he should win here on Saturday night pretty comfortably. I do think it's amazing just how many top-level guys there are at the top end of flyweight. Like for the division which the UFC didn't want, when you've got people like... Uh, Brandon Moreno, Alexander Pantoja, Alex Perez, uh, Kai Kara Francis has already mentioned. You've got a lot of top level guys coming to the top of that division. It just it feels like a bit of a shame that the UFC are going for the quick payday with the Cody Garbrandt fight. Is that something you agree with? Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I was, you know, that's a despicable decision from the UFC, in my opinion. You got Alex Perez, Brandon Moreno on win streaks. And you just give it to a guy who's never fought at the weight class, who's one in three in his past four, three knockout losses. I mean, it's just atrocious decision making by the UFC. I mean, that's Ali Abdi. Al Ali Abdelaziz's influence right there. I mean, he has so much power with dominance MMA that he just gets his fighters undeserved title shots left and right. So I don't like seeing that. But great point about the the, the UFC trying to cut the flyweight division. I mean, you. You didn't even mention the guys they cut already. They cut Dustin Ortiz, uh, Zach McCoskey, J Jared Brooks. I mean, Jared Brooks arguably beat Davis and Figueredo. They traded away uh, Demetrius Johnson for Ben Askren. They got rid of Horiguchi. I mean, they could have the best flyweight division by a, 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 a landslide. I mean, they got men out cape. They're doing some good things. It seems like the, the flyweight division is here to stay. But, yeah, just such a, dis a dumb decision from the UFC to try to cut this – at all and then as you mentioned that uh garbrandt decision to give him the title shot i really disagree with that one are you on the same page with me there I, i'm totally on the same page um one thing i i mean i understand it from the ufc's perspective that they want to try and make some money 
and Cordy Garbrandt is the biggest, biggest name that you can have for a flyweight fight. But I'm the same as you. Title shots need to be earned. And in my opinion, Cordy Garbrandt hasn't earned it. Um, I think it's still going to be a great fight. I can still see them too. I can see Figueredo winning that one. Obviously, we'll discuss that in a bit more detail when it comes to November. Um, I think it's going to be a good fight. But I'd rather it happened in a more natural way. Because the other big issue we've got as well. If Cody Garbrandt wins that fight, there's no way he's going to be fighting an Askarov or a Brandon Moreno. He's going to go straight back up and try to find Piotr Tian. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what the UFC is right now. It's jumping weight classes. I mean, if only the UFC had an example where they tried to bring their 135er down to 125 and he, he'd never fought there before... If only they had an example to look at that. Oh, wait, they do. TJ Dillashaw did this exact same thing, never fought at 25. They gave him an immediate title shot at a new weight class that he never cut weight to before. He cuts the weight. He's extremely dehydrated. He gets knocked out in 25 seconds. Terrible performance, bad decision-making. And then Cejudo goes right up to, to flyweight afterwards. I mean, it's just making a mockery of the belts. It's making a mockery of the weight classes, the process of the rankings, winning fights. I mean, it just it's, these decisions are the ones that ruin the UFC. So we, we shouldn't dwell on this for too much longer. I've, ne- I've a- never been a fan of the double champ thing. Um, that's something I've been quite vocal about on social media. Um, I think it, it's impossible for any fighter to try and defend both belts at the rate that they should. Because the UFC has this sort of unwritten rule that a champion should defend their belt twice a year. So if you're jumping between weight classes, really that's four fights in a year, which just physically can't be done. The only person I think who should have gotten one was Daniel Cormier. Because Cormier has a history of fighting at heavyweight. He cleaned out the division. There was nobody really else coming up at light heavyweight. So him versus Stipe made sense. But everybody else, whether that's uh, TJ Dillashaw, uh, Nunes, Conor McGregor, none of them should have been given that opportunity. And I've been quite vocal about that for a while. Yeah, it's definitely a, a business type of thing that what they're doing at this point. And even though some of the guys pulled off the double champ, you know, Cejudo defended both belts. He's technically the most accredited double champ. I think... Did uh yeah I mean Cormier did too as well but not not at the same time I mean Cejudo did it simultaneously he defended them both so uh, that was impressive but yeah it's it's just a business decision it's to attract more casual viewers I don't even think that Cody Garbrandt will attract more viewers um, than you know Brandon Moreno would for instance but let's uh let's get back to the title fights we shouldn't talk about the negatives for so much we got so many great fights coming up and we got two title fights going on here shortly. And it is now time for us to talk about our first title fight on the card, the Coleman event. It is Dominic Reyes who is taking on Jan Blachowicz. Now an interesting bit, a uh, little tidbit for you as we start this um, segment. The last time a non-John Jones or Daniel Cormier light heavyweight title fight happened in the UFC was UFC 113, the Auto Machida versus Shogun Shua back in 2010. So 10 years those two had dominated this division. This is really, for a lot of people, the start of a new era at the light heavyweight division. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited, too. I think that um, John Jones hasn't really been an exciting fighter for his past maybe four or five fights. Uh, the Cormier fight was his last like really entertaining fight. Uh, I mean, I guess the Reyes one wasn't too bad, but I just think that we're in for a, a, you know, a fresh surprise here. I think that both of these guys, Reyes and Blahovich, are... Um, you know, in their physical primes right now, I think they're both never been better than they are right now. And it's going to be really exciting to see them match up. I think it's a extremely close matchup. I hadn't really thought about it too much. It kind of crept up on me. I didn't even realize it was this week, but these past few days, I've been watching a lot of their fights. I rewatched the Reyes fight with Jones. I watched his Ozdemir fight, and I was rewatching a lot of Blahovich footage too. And I'm really excited for this one. Um, Carl, I'm going to let you go first, and you give me your uh, your prediction on this one. How do you see this? Well, one the first going? thing I need to bring up, which I do have a big bit of an issue with, you sort of touched on it there was that the light heavyweight division has always been one of the marquee divisions of the UFC. When you look at the people like Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, and then of course you had John Jones and his dominance on top. This fight almost sort of feels like it's been crapped on by the UFC. It's almost sort of like, here we've got a title fight for the sake of it. You'd think that the marquee division in the UFC, these guys should be headlining their own show. 
and yet here they are as the core main to a a division which is a, a smaller weight class than what they currently fight in, which I do think is a bit of a bit of a kick in the teeth to uh, Dom and Jan. Um, and I think as well, the light heavyweight division gets a lot of grief from people on the internet. Yet, I think that division is actually a lot better than people give it credit for. Yes, the top five maybe isn't as good as it was, say, five or six years ago. But you look at the guys coming up, you look at people like Pohovska, you look at Nikita Krylov, Ankalaev, Kutalaba, um, Alexander Rakic as well. You've got some really entertaining light heavyweights all coming to the fore. And I think the UFC need to recognise they've got themselves a good division here. They need to promote it. Yeah, I agree. I think that the light heavyweight now is is stronger than it was for the past five years. I think the you said the marquee division. I think that's kind of teetered out a little bit. I mean, we had the DC JBJ rivalry, which kind of reignited a little bit, but I think it's kind of shifted from maybe light heavyweight to more towards lightweight and welterweight. And I mean, I you gotta blame John Jones for that. I mean, he sometimes hasn't had the most exciting fights. He hasn't been active. He got stripped of his belt four times or something like that so there's constant drama going on with the light heavyweight division and i think that that's why we saw a lot of criticism like you mentioned but yeah the, the guys you mentioned yiri and ray kitch and ankalaya those guys are all coming up very skilled entertaining fighters and i think that the light heavyweight division is in great hands and one of these guys is going to be a champion i agree this could headline a pay-per-view on its own but they stack this one up i do agree that israel should be the uh the main event over them i think that that fight is is more yes. deserving of a main event, but agreed that this could this could have headlined uh, any pay per view from the past few years. I mean, it's a great fight. Really excited for this one, and uh, I still want to hear you go first when when it comes down to analyzing this one. I feel like I've been going first, <laughs> so uh, I want to I want to hear your thoughts on uh, how you think they match Go-Man up. Carl. On the deep end there, I think this is a really intriguing one in terms of the two backgrounds of both fighters. On the one hand, you've got Dominic Reyes who. You've got to remember, this is Dominic Reyes' 14th MMA fight. So he's still a relative newcomer. 29 years old, only had the one loss, which was against John Jones, a fight which I agree with a lot of people. I thought that Dominic Reyes won that fight. Uh, first three rounds, I all gave to him. Um, very difficult guy to take down. A lot of power in his hands. But it, it's a strange power in that he finds a lot of success as a counter-striker. He catches a lot of guys coming in. We saw that with Cannonier. We saw that with Chris Weidman. But he doesn't fight like a conventional counter-striker. If you look at the way say, like Adesanya does, where he tries to invite people in and then catches them quick, Dom just seems to happen to have this power. Um, and he, he's obviously he's placed to it really well. Stays on the outside. I think the, the way he fought against John Jones in those first two rounds was very impressive. He made John make the pace of the fight and he and John doesn't like that John likes to use his reach and Dom was having a lot of success in that regard um, obviously the cardio is going to be a big issue as well I think that was just fighting that style where you're staying on the outside you're using a lot of lateral movement it takes a lot out of you and we saw that when he fought against John Jones but I think that's something which comes with experience I think he's going to close that hole in his game the big problem he has, though, is he's fighting a guy in Jan Blachowicz who is an absolute tank of a man. You look at this guy's build, his physique, carries a lot of muscle. He's got a lot of power as well, especially short-range power. We saw it against Luke Rockhold, um, and we saw it against Corey Anderson as well. Um, I just don't see Dominic Rias landing that big knockout punch, whereas I can with Blachowicz. Yeah, I, I agree with that that first point so far. Um, and when you're talking about the records, that's kind of you know what a lot of people look at when they're predicting fights is take a quick glance at the record. Um, that's not really indicative of their skills. But when you look at their their recent fights, I do think that these guys' record is yes. worth talking about. I mean, Reyes had a relatively easy path to the title. He knocked out Christensen, Kimball, 
and Weidman. Those guys aren't really three high-level light heavyweights. You know, Weidman, of course, is a very established fighter, but just did not deserve to be a light heavyweight at all. They threw him to the wolves there. So he's left with, you know, three decisive wins. Cannoneer, he knocked him out before, you know, Cannoneer really started making good adjustments. Owen St. Pru has never been an elite-level fighter, although he's a tough guy to deal with. And then Vulcan Ozdemir, he had a very close fight with him. I did score that for Reyes, but I thought Reyes looked vulnerable in that fight. He ate some big punches. He had got taken down in that fight by a non-wrestler in Vulcan, which was why I was so shocked to see him stuff John Jones' takedowns. I mean, he stuffed a lot of takedowns. He stood up from takedowns. Real athletic, hard guy to hold down. And as you mentioned, the cardio is a concern. Um, he did definitely slow down in rounds four and five of that fight versus Jones, but you know, some guys are good at fighting tired. I think that Dustin Poirier is probably the best one of all, but I thought Reyes fought well while he was tired. I mean, he put up consistent output to give uh, Jones some trouble. He wasn't getting taken down. He was still popping back up from all those takedowns. So he hung in there tough, even though he was definitely tired and out in those last rounds. Totally agree with you that he won one rounds one through three. He put up an incredible pace in that one. And he's going to have to pace himself yes. a little different here because he threw me, he threw maybe 70, 80 strikes in those first three rounds. He needs to drop that down to 50 or 60 because he needs to continue that consistent output throughout five rounds. It's There's no good in, in beating a guy for three rounds because the judges are inconsistent and they gave that fight to Jones anyway. And rewatching it, I thought it was closer than I thought live. I thought Reyes won one and three clearly jones won four and five clearly it really comes down to how you score round two and that was a close one i did give it to reyes still on rewatch but it was a lot closer than i remember live um again carl i'm agreeing with your point about blahovich i do think blahovich has more of that one punch knockout power and i thought it showed clearly in that fight versus anderson i mean the guy has good counter punching skills uh, when, and when he lets his hands go, he has uh, nearly elite boxing, really good boxing skills. He throws a good double jab, power in both hands. I mean, he dropped Luke Rockhold with the left hand. He dropped Corey Anderson with the right hand. So he's got power on both sides. And when you're looking at that competition, as I was talking about earlier, Jan Blahovich, I mean, 7-1 and one in his past eight fights, uh, decision wins, knockout wins, um, Submission wins. I mean, he's doing it all different ways. He beat Krylov, Rockhold. I mean, those are good wins. Corey Anderson, most notably. So I think that Jan Blachowicz is the more proven fighter. I thought I think he's fought and beaten in better, the better competition. And I think he's more well-rounded. I think he's the better offensive wrestler. I think he's a little bit better in, ter in terms of the clinch. And I think he's just a, a better striker in terms of uh, more effective damage. I think Blachowicz is going to be landing the harder punches here. And one point about the Reyes fight I will mention with Jones is Reyes was throwing a ton of output in those early rounds. He was throwing a lot of punches. And one big difference in this fight is John Jones doesn't counterpunch. He has this terrible habit where he, he covers up and he runs away. And he was doing that a few times in that fight where Reyes was throwing combinations. Jones would kind of just trot away on the cage, do that tall man's defense. Blahovich isn't going to do that. He's going to bite down on the mouthpiece and counterpunch and be willing to Reyes in the pocket. And that's something Jones wasn't going to do. So that's going to be a big difference in this fight. I think that the boxing exchanges are going to be competitive. I don't think Reyes is going to be able to leg kick as easily because Blahovic actually checks leg kicks. He's done that in a lot of his fights. And, you know, I think that people can tell at this point that I'm leaning with Jan Blahovic in this fight. I mean, the odds in this one currently have um, Dominic Reyes as a minus 260 favorite, which puts his chances at around 70, 72%. I mean, I think that's way off. I think that... This is more of a, a 55, 45 type of fight and advantage for Reyes. I agree that Reyes should be the slight favorite here, but I think that minus 150 for Reyes would be more appropriate if you if you know odds well. And I think that I really like Jan Blahovic's chances here. I think he checks the light kicks. I think he wins some boxing exchanges, might even hurt Reyes. Reyes with punches along the way and I'm going to pick this one to go to the decision I think it's going to be a competitive fight and I'm going to pick Jan Blahovic to win this one by 48-47 decision so I know that was a lot there I know I had a lot of different points but what do you think about what I said Carl? I totally agree with you I think especially when it comes to I think there's a lot of people out there who are really underrating Jan Blahovic's chances in this fight 
Uh, I ran a poll on the YouTube channel just earlier today. I posted this uh, just a couple of hours ago. And at the moment, they've got Jan Blachowicz 24%, Dominic Reyes 76%, which a lot of that's obviously going to do with the John Jones performance from Reyes, where I did think he performed very, very well. But people are underrated Blachowicz. He does have power. He has, dare I say, more of a, a well-rounded game. I can maybe see him trying to go for a takedown to just throw Dominic Reyes off. Because I think a big factor in why Reyes performed so badly against Volkan was he wasn't expecting Volkan to go for takedowns. And I think he's maybe expecting Blahovitz to keep the standing as well. So if Blahovitz does try mixing in a couple of takedowns, I'm going to be interested to see on how Dom handles that. And Great as we point. saw with Krylov, Blahovitz does have a submission game to him. Yeah, great point. I mean, he, I mean, I, I honestly haven't made that conclusion about the Volkan fight, but I think that's accurate. I think that Volkan was knocking dudes out on the feet. It wasn't really a takedown type of guy, and then all of a sudden he starts shooting takedowns. A very real possibility here that Blahovich attempts takedowns. Great point. I would love the story as well of Blahovich if Blahovich was to win this fight because this was a guy who had a very slow start to his UFC career. I mean, the guy lost to Pat Cummings. And I remember Fight Night Gdansk, he was on the undercard uh, for Devin Clark, who I think just come into the UFC. And there was a lot of people saying if he lost that fight, he was going to get cut. And yet, he's won seven out of his past eight, going to be fighting for a title, could potentially be Poland's second UFC champion. I think that's a fantastic story. Yeah, huge turnaround. He's reinvented his career, as I mentioned, uh, seven and one in his past eight. I think he actually might have been like an underdog to Devin Clark in that fight, which was is crazy in retrospect. And he, you know, he won that fight pretty decisively. Well-rounded fighter, yeah, big fan of Jan Blachowicz. If I had to choose between the two, it would be very. It's very risky to go against Dominic Reyes, considering what we've seen in his uh, thirteen so fights, and especially the John Jones fight. But. I don't see Dominic Reyes knocking out Jan Blachowicz. I do see Jan Blachowicz knocking out Dominic Reyes. So I'm going to go with you. I think there's smart money on Jan Blachowicz to win this fight. Yeah, so do you think he'll win by knockout or do you think it'll be decision? I'm going to say knockout. I'm going to say a late knockout, possibly fourth round. Yeah, I mean, I think it's real, real possible that the power in his hands... It's a, it cannot be ignored. I mean, he's a solid boxer. And I just think that um, the way that Reyes was reacting to punches versus Volkan, I don't think it was very well, uh, good. I mean, I just don't think that we've seen Reyes fight a, a very good boxer. I think mm -hmm. that Volkan is probably the best boxer that we've seen him fight. And Volkan is decent. He's decent everywhere. He's improving. I thought that he made some uh, more improvements after that Reyes loss. I thought that he looked uh, the best he ever had in the, the fight right after that against Ir Latifi. That was a very so, good performance. So I, I just tend to think that Reyes is getting is getting overrated. I think he's a little unproven still. I think that he's definitely getting over-respected by the betting market for that close decision with uh, John Jones. But I think that if Jan Blachowicz was fighting Jones that night, I think there's a good chance that he would have won that fight. He could have even knocked out Jones in the first three rounds with the way that Jones was fighting. Just looked extremely poor in that fight. So I think that Reyes has a, has a chance to win this fight. He's going to have to put up that consistent volume like he did. He's going to have to use his range, his jab, and his, uh, his kicks to keep Blachowicz out of boxing range. I just don't trust him to do so. Um, and the one thing I have written down about the, is about cardio here is, is that Blahovich has been scheduled for five rounds in three of his past four fights. Reyes has only been two of his past three. And we've seen them both go the distance one time, the full five-round distance. And even though Reyes slowed down a little bit in rounds four and five uh, versus Jones, I think that was still a better cardio performance than Jan Blahovich's fight against Jacare Sozo, which was a completely abysmal fight. I did not rewatch that fight this week. I could not get myself to do it. It was just 25 minutes of cage stalling and clinching where pretty much nothing happened. So that was not a good, uh, you know, spot on the record for Jan Blachowicz. It's definitely a concern in that fight that he kind of just was content to have that low output fight. But I think this is just such a different matchup. I don't think it's going to turn out like that at all. And I think that Jan has more ways to win, and I'm going to be picking and betting him here. 
and it is now time for us to talk about our main event of the evening, UFC 253 just around the corner and we have got ourselves probably one of the most eagerly anticipated title fights for a long, long time. Israel Adesanya, the champion, makes the second defense of his belt up against the number two seed, Paulo Costa. Adesanya 19-0, Paulo Costa 13-0, which makes this the first time that two male undefeated fighters have fought for a title since Lyoto Machida vs. Rashad Evans. So we're talking about a good 11 or 12 years. Wow, that's an incredible statistic. I mean, there were a couple of women's fights which happened afterwards. I think Ronda vs. Holly was two unbeaten fighters and Ronda vs. Betch as well. But this is the first time two male fighters, unbeaten fighters, have fought for a title. Ronda vs. Betch, a legend, legendary fight. Um, yeah, but that's a great statistic. It just shows how level, uh, high level these this fight is. I mean, we were complaining a little earlier about Garbrandt not even being ranked, not even fought at 125, and he's getting a title shot. This is a rare chance where we had the actual number one and two middleweight in the UFC going at it head to head. Incredible fight. I'm, I'm looking forward to this one so much. I think that this is going to get a lot of casual attention from people. I think that, um, you know, people who don't watch fights, uh, I think a lot of my friends who don't watch fights know Israel Adesanya. They see him on uh, Instagram, they see him in high highlight reels he's got that it factor and you know paul acosta uh, you know a handsome guy the most jack dude on the entire roster the most physical specimen looking guy on the whole roster i think he beats yo romero for that at this point so this is going to get a lot of attention it's going to be an incredible fight can't wait for it in my opinion and uh so i'll, I'll let you take the lead on this one too carl so give me your first initial thoughts on this one well let's start off first and foremost by talking about israel adesanya now obviously we talk about the job he's done in the UFC, we have had, um, I think he's had eight fights in the UFC, six of those have had performance bonuses, either fight and night performances, or performance of the night bonuses, uh, so the guy is a very entertaining fighter, he knows how to get the job done. That being said though, I think it was the first time since probably the Marvin Fittori fight, we saw a couple of weaknesses when it comes to Adesanya in Yoel Romero, not so much in terms of what Yoel was bringing to Adesanya, but that Izzy just seemed to have no understanding of how to find his openings. Obviously, if you've got a guy in Romero who's not giving you anything to bite on, you can't really do anything with that. And of course, Paulo Costa, his last fight was also against Romero. And he found a lot more success in dealing with that fighting style than what Izzy did. So I'm going to be interested to see in how Adesanya can bounce back. Because Izzy's an entertainer. Izzy enjoys putting on a show for the fans. And I think it hurt him a lot that he that he got so much criticism for the performance against Yoel. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think, um, yeah, it's a great point about how they matched up against Romero. And yeah, what you said, he didn't have anything to react on. Israel's game is based on feints and it's based on reactions from his opponents. But when that stoic Yo Romero is sitting there with the high guard and just marching, doing that defensive stance, sometimes he was standing completely still in the fight. I mean, it was a crazy fight to watch. Yeah, he just had no reactions to go off of. So Israel was confused. He didn't really know what to do. And... Paul Acosta, on the other hand, was just like, I'm just throwing volume, I'm going balls to the wall, just an insane back and forth rounds one and two. I mean, some of the most uh, competitive and exciting striking rounds in UFC history, those first two rounds of the fight, I still see people giving uh, the rounds to, to Paulo, to Yoel, uh, they're going different ways. Personally, I did score it, how the judges scored it, rounds one and two to Costa, round three to, to Romero. But I think we can learn a lot about that fight from Costa. Um, so do you think that Costa's win against Romero was more approved, proved himself more? Or do you think it, it uh, kind of gave you more concerns for this matchup with Israel, Carl? I, I think a little bit of both. I think that Costa had a fighting style which was better, dealt with Yoel Romero a lot better than what Adesanya did. Uh, but... It's, it's a blessing and a curse when it comes to Paulo Costa because Paulo's fighting style relies on backing people up against the fence and just teeing off on them. I've sort of compared him, he's sort of like, I sort of compared him to sort of like a young Vanderlei because Vanderlei has that big wild swinging style. He liked to back people up as well. And he found a lot of success against Romero doing that and he's done so in all of these fights, whether it's Uriah Hall or Bang Bose or I think it was Gareth McClendon. 
Holland he fought in his debut. Um, but that sort of hands down wild style opens you up to a lot of counters, and that's where Israel Adesanya shines. So yeah. I want I, I enjoy Costa's fighting style. It has had a lot of success. He needs to iron out that side of his game if he wants to try and get Adesanya out of there. Because if he tries going down, hands down, big wild swings, he's going to get caught. Yeah, I, I think that's a big problem that he faces in this fight. Is He's he's never fought a guy who can counterpunch, who can ha- evade his strikes like Israel is going to. And when we've seen guys like Ryan Hall you know, throw a jab have some footwork, have some defensive boxing. I mean, he struggled. I think he got uh, he got rocked a little bit in that Uriah Hall fight with maybe just a, a glancing punch behind the ear, but he looked a little hurt there. He got dropped briefly versus Yoel Romero. So I just see um, Paulo Costa as an offensively-minded fighter. I mean, he it has incredible offense. I mean, his his striking can't be taken lightly. I think Dan Hardy called him you know, a, a power lifter in terms of his striking a few months back. And I do think that uh, that is pretty disrespectful and just inaccurate. I mean, the guy has great skills when it comes to striking. He throws punches and combinations. He has great body kicks. He, he cuts off the cage with the body kicks. So he'll throw those big punch combinations and if uh, against the cage like you were talking about. And if you try going one way or the other, he will fire off those body kicks to stop you from being able to escape. I mean, that's high level stuff. That's not just, you know, pure power and aggression. He does have layers to his striking. It's a a shame for him, though. He's running into the most layered striker in the sport of MMA in Israel Adesanya. The guy can just fight in so many different ways, moving backwards, counter punching, leading, going forward. I mean, he really just does it all. And that's why I think that uh, Costa struggles in this fight. I think the the first few uh, rounds will be really close when Costa has all of his energy, all of his cardio. He's going to be throwing out tremendous volume in those first two rounds. But I do think we see Israel countering we're going to see him uh using his footwork to stay off the cage we're going to see israel probably landing the harder punches of the two we're going to see costa swarming those long combinations maybe some punches land but i think that israel will be landing cleaner now when i envision this fight i do see it going into the later rounds the third and fourth rounds and i do think that israel starts to take over in those rounds when costa's cardio slows down but I think that Costa's cardio is a bit unknown, right? We, we've only seen him in round three one time in his career, and it was in, in an incredibly high-paced fight. I mean, he must have landed uh, 60 strikes in the first two rounds each of that uh, Yoel Romero fight. So it's not unexpected that he would gas out in round three, and it's not like he was completely— um, I mean, he was putting his hands on his hips and very tired, but he still did land 44 significant strikes in round four. So it's not like he was completely gassed out. But I think the the cardio is a big concern. What what are you thinking about the cardio of Paulo Costa, Carl? I was very concerned by what I saw in the third round against Joel Romero. I mean, Joel's cardio management is a lot better than what Costa's is. Um, so we've seen Joel go 25 minutes before. I think that's always been one of his strengths as a fighter and we saw that when he fought Paolo Costa I think Costa won the first round I think he won the first half of the second round but from that point on it was all Romero and again it was a fast paced fight and he was fighting against somebody who was also trying to push the pace which is something Adesanya is not going to do but if we start seeing that kind of fast pace of a fight again and Costa starts tiring because you got to remember as well Costa is a big muscular dude he carries a lot of bulk if he tries doing that in the second or third round against someone like Adesanya who is going to latch on every single loose hand it's going to be easy play for Adesanya but Costa is so strong early on and it's that question can Adesanya avoid those big hair makers in the first two minutes of the fight yeah, and I mean, I do think he does uh, avoid them. I think that Paulo can make it close, though. If, if he just conserves his gas tank a little bit more than he did in that, that, that Yo Romero fight. I did check the stats. He landed 37 strikes in both of the first two rounds of 
the Romero fight. So 74 strikes in two rounds. That's just such a high pace. If he tones it down a little bit, kind of like we were talking about with Reyes earlier, if he controls himself, his volume a little more, I think he could make this fight competitive for three or four rounds instead of for one or two. But no matter how I see the early fight going, I just see Israel taking over. Unless Costa is able to knock him out in those first two rounds, I see the experience, the cardio advantage coming out in those later rounds and Israel is going to start to take over talking about the five round experience for these guys again this is Paulo Costa's first five round fight the first time he's actually been scheduled for five rounds meanwhile Israel Adesanya has uh, been scheduled for five rounds in four of his past six fights and we've actually seen him go the full distance three of those times so that's just such an advantage we've seen him in rounds four and five we've seen him carry power leading into the fight I mean look at the Kelvin Gaston mm-hmm. fight he was dropping Kelvin and hurting him and had him near finished after a 25 minute grueling back and forth fight he still had that cardio late in the fight and I think that that's why I'm picking Israel Adesanya by late finish instead of by decision I initially was thinking oh Costa might be tough enough to make it to the full decision maybe Israel doesn't have that power to finish him but when you look at the power that he carried late into that fight and just how sharp he is in those late rounds and the cardio fall off that I expect Costa to have, I do think we see a late finish from Israel Adesanya. So in terms of an official prediction, I'm going to go with Israel Adesanya by fourth round TKO. Um, but I'm not discrediting Costa. I think that in terms of a pre-fight bet in this one, I do think that I would rather be betting on Paulo Costa as the underdog here because, in my opinion, rounds one and two are going to be the closest rounds of the fight. And if Paulo Costa wins, he's either going to win those rounds or win by knockout in those rounds. So if you want to bet Israel Adesanya in this fight, I would say stay away from the pre-fight money line and look to live bet him about 7 to 10 minutes through this fight if you have access to live betting. If you don't, I would honestly recommend passing on Israel Adesanya because he does have a chance to lose this fight early. But if he survives that early storm, if he gets through the first 7 or 10 minutes, I think that Israel Adesanya will be a great live bet if the odds are good. So I will be looking to live bet um, Israel Adesanya here. And the official prediction for me is going to be Israel by fourth round TKO. So I'll pass it back to you, Carl. Sorry, I've been talking for the past few minutes. Uh, saves me. I've got an awful speaking voice anyway, so probably doing me a favor. You touched on something there as well with the Kelvin Gastelum fight. Adesanya has had experience of handling adversity because Kelvin gave him a lot of problems. Obviously, he rocked him in the first round, rocked him in the fourth round as well. And he managed to come back and get the job done. Costa's faced adversity as well, but he's never faced it at that sort of high level, high stakes. The only, I mean, we saw, I mean, we saw Uriah Hall catch him coming in, rock him. And then, of course, there was Yoel Romero fight. How is he going to handle it if Adesanya does properly catch him and crack him? How is he going to respond to that? And in my opinion, from what I've seen, I have a lot of question marks about it. I mean, even Johnny Hendricks was causing cost of issues in that first round. So I sort of question how cost is going to handle it if he does get that big shot. Yeah, I agree with the the adversity thing. I mean, really, the most adversity he's faced was probably the jab of Uriah Hall and in round three of Costa, uh, round three of Romero. And Romero was, you know, landing hard and going for the big kill. But, I mean, although it doesn't doesn't sound right to say, even because Romero has so many round three knockouts, but he sometimes doesn't carry the power late into the fight. It seemed like that fight, he was pretty much pure volume in those later rounds. He wasn't, didn't have the power to knock out Costa. And I do think that Costa is going to be insanely durable. I think that, um, I mean, I don't have any problem with saying that I think he's on steroids. I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I don't, I think that fighters should be allowed to honestly, but that's beside the point. I think that It's undeniable that Costa is just juiced up on everything. And, I mean, I think that sometimes we see those guys show insane durability. Like Davison Figueredo, just an insanely durable guy, another similar type of guy. I shouldn't go off with my theories too much about Costa. I don't want to discredit him at all because I have a ton of respect for the guy. But I do have a feeling he's going to show insane durability and just eat some massive shots. Like the punches that knocked out Robert Whitaker. I think he might eat some of them and go later into the fight. But... 
eventually the power and volume of Israel will succumb uh, and he will eventually get finished in those later rounds. Um, what are you thinking for, in terms of an official prediction for this one? If the fight's going to finish early, it's going to be a cost knockout. If it goes to the third round, the longer this fight goes on, I favor Adesanya. I think Adesanya can get it done in the third round. Yep, I like that pick a lot. I mean, he that's when he slowed down the last fight. So uh, I think that that's when we start seeing him, go, uh, you know, fall off that cardio cliff here. So that is all of the uh, previews done for the USC 253 show. I want to say a big thank you to uh, John Marsh and MMA for joining me today. Uh, John, just give a bit of a call out to your podcast. Um, try and get yourself a few more subscribers. Yeah, no, thanks again, Carl. I mean, I really appreciate what, what you do. You're, you have a great channel over at It's Not Cage Fighting. And yeah, you can find me on Twitter at UFO underscore UFC. That is at UFO underscore UFC. You can just search me up. I'm John Martian MMA on there. My podcast, Martian MMA, comes out pretty much every Thursday or Friday on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. I analyze and predict every single UFC fight uh, since UFC 218. I've done a, a podcast before every single UFC card for about two and a half, almost three years. So you can find my podcast on those three platforms. I track all my official bets on betmma.tips. You can find all these links on my Twitter and in my YouTube description. But uh, thank you all for listening. I hope you all check out my podcast. And uh, just once again, thanks uh, for Carl for having me uh, over on his great channel. You're very welcome. And thank you for stepping in on short notice as well. Obviously, we've had a lot of people who have been unable to record the show. Um, and best of luck to uh, Claire, Gina... Um, I know Gina's going uh, back to school, that's why she couldn't be doing it, she was doing a bit of studying. Clay's moving into a brand new house, hence why he couldn't be there. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to, to you for joining us. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to the viewers for tuning in. Uh, this is the INC, thank you for watching, we hope you enjoy UFC 253. See you guys.